<laughs> um, so yeah, so the specific term that we end up using for this is learnifying gaming. We do this very specifically on purpose because we tend to be put in a place in the box of gamification or gamifying learning, which is taking aspects of video games and putting them in a learning environment. We are not doing that. Uh, we are making a fully fledged video game from the ground up. So a little bit on me. Um, I'm the senior founder of FIANA, which is what I'll be talking about today. My background is in Sp uh, Spanish second language teaching. I'm a certified teacher. I've taught middle school, high school, and university Spanish. Uh, and then I was a bilingual paraeducator. Uh, and then I was doing a master's in Hispanic linguistics. I purposely put unfinished very explicitly. I left uh, just before finishing the master's here so that I could work on uh, and start my company full time. Then in the past kind of year, I've raised uh, around 80,000 for Faena. This include investments from Notion, Notion CTO and COO. I don't know if you guys know of Notion. Um, it's a pretty well known kind of unicorn startup. So the main problem that we're dealing with today is that out of the 10 million K-12 students learning a language in the school in the US, only 4% end up making it to fluency which is not a very good number. <laughs> you know, if you have this entire structure in place, this entire kind of pipeline in place for, uh, which in many schools around the US is required to have at least two years of a language, you know, starting in like, when did you take any classes in high school, middle school? When did that start, like seventh grade? I think somewhere around there, yeah. Seventh grade, yeah, that was when mine started. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and yet, uh, you know, you have all these classes, all these teachers, this entire pipeline and only 4% come out of it actually fluent in all of that effort. So what are we doing wrong? How can we remediate this? Um, what are the kind of issues that we're facing? And then as I describe these issues, um, I'm specifically describing the ones that we're attempting to solve. So first is a lack of focus on speaking and culture. And when I talk about language learning in the US, I'm t doing this in very, very broad strokes. Uh, I'm talking about mostly K through 12, uh, less so in university. University has a lot more, I think, um, creative leeway in what they can do um, and time to focus on things like this. But in general, when you want to learn a language, the big fo focus should be, I want to learn how to speak this language. And then part of learning how to speak it is learning how to interact uh, in these relevant cultures in which these languages uh, partake in and, and are a part of. So first, and I guess this is just for you, but I guess you guys too, um, do you guys feel at all that your language learning experience focused on speaking and culture? Yes? No? Maybe? <laughs> Uh, it depends which language. Yeah. Okay. Which language uh, ended up being a bit better focusing on speaking in practice? Well, I, w I would say so. Uh, yeah, like the way, for example, in California that the Spanish is taught in the high schools didn't really uh, engage me. Um, it was like, okay, it, it's almost counterproductive at times because you have to make the choice between do you want to uh, get the grade or do you want to actually learn the language and that that's actually been a consistent problem I would say in language education um, formally but then I just was able to self-learn uh, when I had motivation right. in a lot of other cases yeah 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 so that's that's what we're talking about in the, in the next problem is that you know, if, if, if it's not doing its job, if you teach, not necessarily a teacher or the curriculum that they've been given or the paradigm that we're in, um, if they're not focusing on speaking practice, which is one, the point, and then two, it's much more fun, you get to really interact with it, uh, then, then you end up having to do it yourself. And that's not what we want. So one thing uh, is that the target for many second language learner, learners is not just to speak this other language, but to become part of the social and cultural environment in which this language is used. And so that is how important this cultural component is. Um, and it's very often not the focus of you know, these uh, conjugation worksheets and these fill in the blank worksheets, uh, and that's not fun. So what happens instead? So if we're not focusing on speaking and culture, um, Michael, would you like a stab at this? What, what, what are we focusing on instead, do you think? Just to name a few. Uh, meeting whatever requirements to get through a paper, get through a quiz. Uh -huh. What are the quizzes normally quizzing you on? 
minutia. Minutia. Okay, we're going to use the term minutia to describe all of these. So typically, it's a, there's an emphasis on grammar, memorization, translation, uh, which is similar to the way that we taught Latin in the 1500s, uh, when it was not a spoken language anyway, and it was being used, um, or people, rich Europeans kind of were learning Latin to, as a status symbol and not necessarily as a means of needing to communicate with a certain populace. Uh, then you have a lot of conjugation tables, like I said, and a big focus on reading and writing. I think part of the focus on reading and writing, and I, and I saw this and felt this when I was in the classroom, uh, it is much easier to grade those things than it is to grade uh, a speaking exercise. Now it's, it's a tiny bit easier because you have, um, like towards the end of when I was getting certified, they had this cool software that they could whip out their phone and just quick record like a 30 second um, little thing of them talking in Spanish or whatever you know we were talking about. Uh, and those are great, but you still have to, you know, go through all of those. It's much harder to kind of automate that kind of that grading process. So um, the outcome of this is that students are meant to do minutia, uh, memorizing overly complex linguistic concepts, uh, but end up not being very well versed in cultural competency. They end up being able to read and write better than they can speak. This is the biggest thing that I saw in my classroom, and I've taught finish one through four, and even up to four, and four ends up being um, literature, so I mean, it's good that they can read and write for that, but um, they still couldn't speak very much, and they still had similar speaking levels to the Spanish students and the Spanish ones, or it was a very wide range, meaning that it just really depends on the teacher that those students had, or were lucky enough to have had, um, that they got the chance to speak a lot. Uh, and then another thing that happens, uh, and I forgot the hyperlink to the papers on this, but uh, you, uh, it oftentimes happens that you develop performative anxiety. So a lot of, uh, you know, you, s you don't have a lot of practice speaking in the classroom, and then very suddenly you have this final presentation that you have to do, uh, and you have to speak suddenly, uh, and you're not prepared for that, and then you also are prepared to converse with native speakers, which would be just another level that you really haven't been prepped for. And that's not what we want. The second thing, the second problem that um, I've kind of diagnosed, the problem with the language learning, language um, doctor, <laughs> uh, a lack of a vibrant language learning experience. So when you focus on these minutia, as you put it, uh, the grammar, the memorization, the translation, and not having the focus on speaking and culture, you end up not having this very, very rich experience um, that language learning should be, because this is a very interesting thing. So, Michael, and this is for you guys too, if you want to answer. Um, was there anything that made you feel less motivated in your language learning journey? In any of the classes that you ever took, even if it was a long time ago, or not that long ago? Well, I can say like what, motiv what makes my students feel less motivated, especially if I you know, go back 10 years and look at my classroom. You know, it was a total focus on grammar and worksheets and this kind of stuff. Um, and I'd set music and I'd be working on it in class and I thought people were learning. Um, they were, I think, just learning how to fill out worksheets. Mm. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, the worksheet model is, um, it's, it's a good placeholder, I think. I think it's, we're doing the best we can. Uh, anything for you, Michael, that made you, any like specific things you remember that your teacher did or that, that happened in the classroom? Well, I think the biggest thing I've encountered this semester is a kind of disparity. There are some of us that came in familiar with the culture, somewhat self-taught, highly motivated, and then there's some people who have come in and like they're, you know, a couple months in and they don't even have the alphabet down. And so when you're vastly different motivation levels in a, in like a introductory class, like you have you know, people that might be self-taught, but they're mass missing certain key concepts, and they're going to be dragged down by the people with no familiarity. And, and there's, I'm not sure there's a good way academically to solve that problem. Like, first year is ultimately first year, but mm -hmm. it, it does definitely demotivate. What's the demotivating thing specifically? Is it seeing the other students struggle, or is it you yourself being one of those students and seeing other people kind of ahead of you, something like that? No, it's uh, it's that because you're ahead of the rest of the class, you don't feel like you're really learning much or being prepared 
for the next step up where it will be more difficult. You're not being challenged. Not just not being challenged, but your specific gaps in knowledge are not being correctly ah, filled. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Differentiation is pretty difficult uh, at any level, um, and meeting all the needs of all those different students, and it could definitely feel not very motivating. So, in order to make a vibrant language learning experience, uh, we can use these quotes. Um, first is from Alice, oh, they're both from Alice Warren 19, actually. So the major force of learning is usage experience. So this is being very engaged, purposeful, authentic, rich, and enacted usage, which goes back to, we mentioned usage so much, it goes back to the idea that we must speak, we must, we must enact this language in order to learn it and in order for that learning experience to be so vibrant. Now, a part of that is memory. So in order to build very rich memories, which helps us stay motivated over the many, many years that it's going to take anyone to be fluent in a language, uh, we can look at this. So the memory representations that result from an experience are representative of that experience. So if you have a really, really bad experience, you're going to remember it as it being pretty bad. But if the properties of the experience are rich, imageable, and multimodal, so too is the memory. So multimodal, we mean you have to speak it, you have to hear it, you have to interact with it in many different modes um, in order for it to get lodged into your memory as something um, kind of very intertwined in your brain. So what's happening instead is what you mentioned in the very beginning, Michael, is that learners end up having to motivate themselves through the years and years that it's going to take you to get to fluency. Uh, another thing, I don't know, I forgot all the hyperlinks in this, but um, it was found that instructors account for over 80% of all the demotivating aspects in a classroom, which is a lot of, uh, we'll say, responsibility on a single uh, instructor to be motivating an entire group of, of students um, all at once. Uh, and there's not enough meaningful usage that's occurring. Again, we have this lack of speaking and using the language. and a part of that meaningful usage, we need it to be authentic as possible. And that's very hard to recreate in a physical kind of brick and mortar classroom environment. There are a lot of things against you, uh, or against all of us when we're teaching. Um, first is that we have, you know, it's one single kind of expert instructor going to, uh, speaking towards a, a whole group of students that are there to learn from you. And it's impossible for me as a teacher to represent an entire language, right, that's full of all of these different dialects and different ways of speaking and communicating that meaning. Um, and so it's, it's a big hill that, that we're up against. So the outcome, um, Michael, you're one of the self-motivated few that have made it, congratulations, <laughs> at least in Russian, I don't know what else you've been taking. Um, but very often this is how we end up with that 4%, is that most people give up, they haven't been motivated to, to continue learning, um, they you know, ended up with a um, kind of demotivating teacher or the, the content itself wasn't engaging enough, they didn't get enough chances to speak. Um, but almost everyone that we've talked to and we've done customer discovery for this, including my own students when I was on their case when I was still teaching them when I just wanted to get their ideas on Fiona, um, is that they, they had one of these experiences uh, in their, their high school or middle school classroom and then they ended up needing, coming back to taking uh, a language class in university because it was required. For the most part, that's the case. And then there was, and I found this in all of my classes, there's always like four or five people that are going to get A's, they're going to be interested in it, um, and they're gonna be okay. But a lot of the reasoning behind it, uh, this is very anecdotal, but but from, from what I saw was that they were more just like uh, hardworking students, and they had the practices, you know, from high school, middle school, that they probably got from their parents or their friend group to always do their homework, always turn things in on time, basic organizational skills of being a good student in this paradigm. And we don't want that. We only we don't want the system to only work for the that group of people. So. What we need to do is to speak, teach to speaking fluency, because that's the whole point, it also makes it much more fun, and we need to motivate all in a single place. So first we need to learn by doing, so we need to learn to speak and converse uh, with native speakers in a culturally rich, authentic, and social environment, uh, the priority there being social, sociocultural interactions. 
Then, uh, I, I figured out this term last night because it's a very good way of describing this, but uh, distributed motivation. So we need that motivation to not just be all on you as a student. It can't be all on the teacher to do that job either. It can't be all on the curriculum because that's not, that's not going to pull it off. So instead, we want that motivation to be on a complex world, complete with actors, so these be native speakers, and we want this entire world to be driven by an experiential narrative. Meaning not narrative that you see passively, but narrative that you actively participate in. Which is Fianna. So, so what we're doing is we're learnifying gaming through voice recognition and narrative-driven language learning video games. By voice recognition, we mean that in order to advance in the narrative of the game, you must speak. You cannot get away with not speaking. Um, we have a couple fail safes in place that kind of offer other options once you've tried speaking. So you can type eventually, um, but we want to kind of increase that barrier as much as possible. The idea is to bring language learning out of its 500 euro grammar memorization and translation. I call it a plague. It's a wording not for you guys, for my investors, <laughs> and into a, a learning through playing era. Um, playing and tinkering and this idea of just kind of experiencing something, uh, it makes the, the experience all that more rich and multimodal and vibrant, and that's what we want. This will give a better idea of what we're actually doing, and then I'll break it down. Bienvenida a la Plaza de Colibrí, Opilla. I know you don't know much Spanish yet, but I need you to help us out. Hola. Hola. Muy buenos días. Me das unos tamales, por favor. Sí, claro. Aquí los tienes. ¡Qué cafecito tan rico! Gracias, Pilla. Ahora me siento mucho mejor. teachers who are very busy. Uh, and then on top of that, it's around um, 1,600 individual downloads. That was last like June. I don't know how much more it's been. Uh, investments, and then we're building out episode one now, currently. These are some quotes. I'm not going to read them, but basically, it's not bad. People like it. Uh, it's only, the demo was only like 30 minutes. The fastest that I saw it completed was like 40 minutes uh, to like through over three class periods, a lot of teachers kind of made lessons alongside of it, and I helped them with materials that um, that would kind of enhance the learning that was happening in the game uh, to in the classroom as well, which is really fun. Uh, and then also, these are from, uh, so this is from a teacher, a student, and then a gamer. So this is meant to be targeted towards two, uh, two different populations, or three. One is to have this product in uh, schools for teachers to uh, give to their students and have it be a huge focus on speaking and cultural and culture um, and, and the students obviously get that uh, but the idea that we've seen what we've seen a lot in, in, edu in ed tech products is that they create things that make more work for the teacher which is not what we want um, in order for me as a teacher to have picked up something like this it would have to be me like sitting in a corner really chilling out um, and not necessarily uh, doing a lot of work to understand how the, the platform, this like really advanced technological platform works. We don't want that, so it's made to be extremely user friendly, uh, and it's made to basically be that uh, you can open it and play, and that's it. So I'm gonna, how much time do we have? So I'm gonna break down 
um, what were what you guys kind of just saw. So this is broken into the narrative component characters, which are these actors, um, and the voice recognition system that we're using, and other game systems that um, that you would have seen kind of in play in the trailer. So first is narrative. The, this is kind of the learning component, or one of the biggest ones. This is we'll say that this is like the majority of the learning is happening on in, in this area. So we're organizing the game via chapters. So think of uh, literally chapters in a story, there's no other way to describe it. Um, we're not organizing this by isolated grammar concepts. Uh, there is explicit learning um, and breakdown of, uh, of what you saw in these interactions, but that's not the primary um, exposure to the language or practice of the language. So each chapter advances the overarching narrative. Um, the narrative that we are dealing with, first we place you in a rich and futuristic world, that has been ravaged by a deadly pink fungus. And this is an idea that I came up with before I knew about The Last of Us, so it is uh, completely original. Um, and, then, and then the premise basically is that uh, after crash landing high in the Colombian Andes, you wake up in the strange town of Colibrio with no memory of your own past, so you have amnesia. Which I know is a cop out, but it's very useful in this case. And as you work to regain your memory of why you were flying here in the first place, uh, you're very charmed by the town's inhabitants, colibreños, and you begin to work. Oh, little typo. You begin uh, your work in getting to know them and their way of life. In the process of getting to know them, that's the basic premise. You're going to do a bunch of faenas. Uh, so within each chapter or, or faenas, uh, these are tasks that you do for the collective well-being of the community at large. It's a very collectivist community in nature. These are one of the communities, these isolated communities that was able to survive this fungus. Um, and you, in those finas, you have to interact with people in the target language, you have to interact with creatures in the target language, and you have to interact with the environment, sometimes just through kind of like an obstacle course that like you saw in the demo, um, but also sometimes using the target language as well. And this is all, or we'll say like it's 90% spoken, 10% um, small text things. The characters that you um, will encounter, the first is you yourself. Uh, you are Pitya. Um, this is the player character that crash landed into the Colombian Andes. Uh, this character can be male, female, and non-binary. You choose this in the very beginning. Um, as of right now, the demo, well, the demo is not long enough to you could just uh, end it and pick a new gender to begin with, but we'll make it so that at any point in time you could change your gender, um, because why not? Then the colibreños in general, the inhabitants of Colibrio, uh, Pilla has to go interact with the colibreños to advance in the game, solve problems for them. Um, you know, it, the demo mostly deals with uh, how a handful of colibreños were in the plaza when there was a fungus outbreak and they weren't able to get inside, so they're very sick. And in order to make them feel better, get them healthier, is through bebidas calientes, so through some hot drinks. Uh, and this is a big cultural component um, because hot drinks play a big role in Hispanic culture in um, kind of feeling good, like homey. It's what your mom would make you if you didn't feel good. It's what my husband asks me to make him when he doesn't feel good. Uh, so that's what we do in the demo, and that's part of the way that we're bringing in a huge culture element that is the for, uh, forefront of all of this. Uh, Sophia is the uh, kind of like your main person. She's the only character in the town that speaks English. So she does uh, a bit of your translation. She helps you understand things, uh, helps you with pronunciation anything that you might have trouble with. And then the initial, in the very beginning, since we're dealing with going from zero to fluency, uh, in the very beginning, um, it's slightly more English heavy with her, and then she'll, she speaks in kind of like a Spanglish, um, not, not close to but she's very multilingual. Then other characters are Pachas. Pachas play a huge role in the narrative. They are small, uh, obviously very cute, uh, animal-like companions, uh, and they're very mysterious in origin. So they started coming out after the fungus kind of hit the earth, um, and these pachas just started hanging out with humans. Um, part of the things that you can do with them in terms of learning and speaking, um, you use mandato, so you can give them commands, and these commands will be in the target language, you know, to go get something that you can't reach, to fight off things that you can't fight yourself, or maybe you're wounded and you can tell them to fight. Um, and all of that is in the target language, all those voice recognition. 
Um, I'll go through a couple of them. I just kind of filled these because I'm very into this aspect. <laughs> they're also matched with uh, specific colibreños, so their personalities are sometimes between their pacha and the human, their personalities are sometimes foiled, sometimes they kind of go together. We have baca pacha, that's a cow, pudu pacha, um, which is like a Colombian mini deer called the pudu, maybe just pudu? Maybe, anyway, maybe perro pacha, which is based on the, um, the Mexican hairless dog, or Peruvian hairless dog. Uh, culpacha is based on the Andean culpeo, uh, which is a. Can anybody guess what animal that is? Vaguely? It's not a cat. Fox. <laughs> fox? Yes, the culpeo is a fox. Um, we have tapir pacha, dreja pacha, based on the comadreja, burro pacha. Um, some of these designs are uh, pre concept art made by AI and some of them have been already modeled, animated, ready to go. Um, and Culpacha should be in the updated version of the demo. Perro Pacha is on the way. Perro Pacha is Sofia's Pacha, so you'll see him around. The voice recognition system. Uh, the point of this is to speak the entire time. That's what kind of differentiates this from. Um, there are a few other language learning games out there, and then they don't, you don't speak. Um, what do you do? <laughs> Running around, learning vocab. Uh, so learning happens with your voice. We are <coughs> uh, using, I think, Google's voice recognition system. So that's that's included. Uh, and you can do this through Mac, PC, or Chromebook. The idea is to focus on meaning over accuracy, especially in the beginning. And then the idea is as we design more and more of the game and you advance in the game, and as you advance in the game, your language uh, skills advance as well, then accuracy would be more of a, of a component, but never the priority. So if you get the majority of what you were supposed to say, what it was expected of you to say correct, then you pass through. And um, so if you say tomato in, instead of tomates, then you pass through, because the idea is to kind of make it as uh, realistic with native speakers as possible. So if you were actually talking to someone and they heard you say that, they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, I know what you meant. Go ahead, I, I know what you meant. Other game systems that are within our game world as of right now, uh, one is resource collections. So you will explore different environmental zones to find and acquire different items. You'll use those items to craft other, um, you'll use those resources to craft items. Uh, these are, this is um, un cafecito. We're not calling this like un cafe because we're basing this first in the Colombian Andes. And now it's a cafecito. So it's a cabecita, and this is a chocolate caliente. As in the, in the as the world expands and you move in, uh, in different you know geographic areas, then the way that people speak and the things that you would learn and the items that you would have to make would be representative of that area and how they would say it. So if they can say cabecita in one area, you'll learn that, but it might be a new term um, as you explore. You also have characters profiles. The idea that we're kind of trying to uh, communicate within the Faena world, especially in Colibrio, is the importance of people and who they are. We really want to emphasize the social interaction and why you do these nice things for these people. Um, so as you learn new things about them, you keep track of uh, their favorite activities, foods, interests, uh, who broke up with who, the detailed like uh, dating chart, you know, all these things, um, because those things will be uh, important in terms of what you make for them, who you talk to, when, um, you're part of this town and you're part of the social uh, network that's there. And in general, we have problem solving, so you'll, you'll uh, talk to someone, get clues to, to find some other resource, uh, get your pacha to reach a hard to reach area, you have to resolve disputes with new people, um, avoid or deal with danger. You can always run away, maybe, until we force you to deal with some of the enemies that are in the game. Um, but yeah. Looking ahead, in general, we are currently selling episode zero, so this is the expanded version of the demo. We've fixed all the things that students found, all the bugs that they found, uh, and we're talking right now to Spanish teachers and programs and principals, um, and we're of course looking uh, to use whatever funds we get from selling and then also uh, through grants or more investments so that we can expand the game world. The idea is to release a fully fledged, the 40 hour video game, which would be, which would be the equivalent of a Spanish one course, at least time-wise. 
but you could infinitely play within the game. You could always go back and redo something or find different side quests to explore. Um, and we need a lot of funding to be able to pull that large of a world off. In general, what we need right now are Instagram followers, although I'm not as active on Instagram as I was maybe a year ago. And then emails on our uh, wait list for it's not the demo, it's episode zero. But yeah, lots of questions. Anything you guys want to know? I have a question. Mm -hmm. When it comes to um, actual development of the game, so did you outsource this? Do you have a friend who's doing it? Like, because uh, I think I'm sure a lot of people have thought of video game, if a kid, you know, mortification of it. Um, to actually take the step and create something is very challenging. Mm -hmm. so yes, to do that. it's very expensive. Um, so I have a CTO. So my tech person is my co-founder. Uh, he's a Unity 3D developer, mm -hmm. full stack engineer. Um, it's I thought it looked like you were using Unity. Yes, it's in Unity. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, although Unreal it has a lot of incentives. Um, and also grants. They have like a 200k grant. Um, but yeah, uh, and then some of it is outsourced. So we have some contractors doing some of the modeling. We have some in house that are more kind of close to the core team. Um, but in general, it's mostly me and, and yeah, it's my CTO. And so is it on, you play it on your, like download it for your computer, yes. or can you do it on your phone, or? Okay. Not phone yet. Um, there, the Chromebook version is very technically a tablet version, um, but it's mm -hmm. meant for a Chromebook because we haven't changed the way that the controls are set, so it's not, mm -hmm. no touch pad or anything like that. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's for Mac, PC, and Chromebook computers. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how hard coded the whole thing is. I mean, I can see potential. Like as I was looking through it, I'm looking through all of the things that would turn me off about playing the game, and then I'm like, wait a second, I do know a target demographic that this game would work very well for, which is my nieces who are between the ages of let's say preteen to late teen, mm -hmm. and I think this is more the Animal Crossing demographic is where this game would really come into play, um, for lack of a better word. Animal Crossing demographic, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. um, and I see a lot of potential for it. Um, I would hate to see you do all this work and only have it work for one language. You know what I mean? How, what efforts are you putting into localization? So the idea is to put a significant amount of effort for each language um, because it's entirely cultural based. So the environments that we're making, the characters that we're making, uh, down to the story arc, down to the animals. Uh, down to the dialogues, uh, everything is based off of based on the target language and the specific geographical area that you start out with, and then you move around. Um, so that's one of the things that we that we have to do, knowing what we know about what language is um, and the role that culture plays in that. That it's not as easy for us using this model to switch very quickly to a different language and to teaching another language because you're so focused on making the culture part of the gameplay. Okay, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. The whole world is, you're in the Colombian Andes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So everything you say, everything you do, all the people you meet, it's all geared towards that. I mean, you might make it work for Quechua, but... Yes, <laughs> you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, <laughs> yeah, as we switch to other languages, we'll do our best to kind of uh, use the same base models for the different animals, the different trees, you know, to kind of lower costs as much as possible. Um, but in general, um, if we had an infinite amount of money, it would be a full kind of a full team on each language creating things from the ground up. What um, what what is your time frame like for for bringing this to completion? Well, I thought it would uh, be quicker to get funds, but it's that's proven more difficult, especially since SBB Bank fell in was that May of this year. March? I don't know. So the market right now is not conducive to uh, any, getting anything funded other than AI. Mm -hmm. although, although our voice recognition system does include AI, and we also have to do a pretty significant effort for the voice recognition system to work with our specific users, which are language learners, not already native speakers. And every voice recognition system in the world is trained on native speakers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not what we want because we don't we don't expect you to sound like a native speaker when we start. 
that doesn't make any sense. Um, but essentially that timeline is very unknown and constantly changing. Um, and as soon as I get a million dollars, it'll take 18 months to build a full game. So it's one million, 18 months. Mm -hmm. So you said that you start out in the Colombian Indies and then you move around. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, this, that's more on the, the design side. Uh, pretty much the first full game would take place in the Colombian Andes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would move, um, we, we don't have a lot of that built out. We just know mm -hmm. that you would move. You okay. kind of figure out where the story would make sense after mm -hmm. that. Um, but we do know that we need to skew, so it's not a 100% accurate representation of people in the Colombian Andes, for example. It would be kind of doing our best to have as many different characters that are from different parts of Colombia. Mm -hmm. And then always there'll be some Mexican speakers because mm -hmm. we know that here that's, uh, that's the target demographic. Okay. But yeah, you go hang out in Chile, come back up mm -hmm. and go up to Mexico, go up to even like the, this part of the US. But it would all be in this, this kind of post apocalyptic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.